please let me welcome on our stage uh, Derek Gallagher. Derek is the managing director of emerging companies at Global Shares. Derek, welcome and all the best with the panel. So Marion, thank you so much. Appreciate that. And uh, thanks everybody and welcome to this Startup Prime Talk. Um, and again, welcome to everybody in, in Tel Aviv, Berlin and London. Um, if fundraising is in your future, then you're really in for a treat today. We've got some pointers from two incredible investors. So two people that we're going to welcome uh, onto the virtual stage today. We've got Sora joined from, from New York by Elodie Dupuy. And, and Elodie is the founder of Full In Partners. Hi, Alady. Hi, Samuel. How are you? Hi. Welcome, Hi, guys. Welcome, guys. And it's Elody. It's lovely to see a bit of sunshine in the background behind you there. Yep. Yeah, very good. So what, what we're going to do today is really we're, 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 we're speaking to an audience of people who are thinking about fundraising, thinking about investing. And this is where we get a chance to pick your brains. So for you guys who, who are at the cold face of this, you speak to so many uh, different companies, everything from startups through to growth stage companies. And this is a chance really to, to get some insight from you that, that you can share with the audience. So maybe, Elodie, if I, if I could start out with you and maybe just kind of setting the scene a little bit. If, if we talk about um, full in partners, you know, founding teams often, you know, we, we talk about people trying to reach out and, and reach out to investors, impress investors um, and, and almost potentially take, you know, any bit of money that comes along. But that, that's not your approach at all. And it's something I believe you feel very passionate about. So can you talk to me a little bit about how how founding teams or invest companies raising money? They don't just need to find those investors, but they got to screen those investors and make sure they find that right fit. Sure. So I guess there's a couple uh, parts to what I'm saying. Uh, part one is there's a an increasing view that you have to raise capital to start a company. And uh, when I was learning to invest back in 2008, 2009, uh, the best businesses that we were often most excited about were the ones that had been bootstrapped and had reached some kind of scale on their own. Um, we're showing profitable unit economics. And, you know, I know the market's been a little bit hyped over the last five years and, you know, Snowflake is doing a great job in the public markets. And I think there still continues to be a lot of interest in software, uh, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you can build a bootstrapped profitable business. And if you can start with the understanding and expectation that you should do that, um, you end up really opening a lot of doors for yourself that you close if you start off immediately fundraising uh, for a seed round, series A, et cetera. Um, so, so the first step is, you know, challenge your own assumptions around how much do you need really? Um, is raising external capital your only option for achieving that outcome? Or are there other solutions and workarounds that you can do either hiring interns or, you know, outsourcing something that you'd rather have insourced uh, that let you build up a business where you've got your own cash flow. And the reason I say that is um, I'm certainly not advocating against taking capital. I think, you know, VC has become a large industry because it's been able to be uh, materially important to founders. But what's always surprised me as an investor is when we go through a diligence process, um, we put founders through a lot. Uh, we get very invasive in terms of the data of the company, the team that we're meeting, I'm sorry, it's a little bit windy where I am, but hopefully it's not not too hard to hear me. Um, you know, we ask a lot of questions around the strategy, the roadmap. We talk to references, we talk to customers, and we just do our diligence on that company. And I don't know that I've ever met a founder who has done diligence on a fund. Um, I don't. I've never had a founder who's asked me for personal references of companies I've worked with in the past. I've never had them ask me about my returns and what they look like in my portfolio. Uh, case studies of what I've done for companies besides the anecdotal story. Um, and I feel like, you know, there's there's been a lot of push lately for funds to become more founder friendly. And the default tool for that has been, um, you know, clean, clean structures and high valuations. And while that can be an element of being founder friendly, um, it's not necessarily the one that's in the founder's best interest because it doesn't address like, is this firm actually going to deliver on what I'm being pitched? Oh, sorry, I'm in a bad spot. I don't know where to go in Greenwich, Connecticut, where it's quiet. Um, and I'm so sorry, it's my day got away from me and I got stuck here. So sorry to everybody in the audience. Um, but I, I, I think there could be a lot more 
uh, questions that come out of founders around, you know, tell me about the return profile of the fund. What is the top 10 companies, you know, of all time? What do they look like? What do the rest of your companies look like? And if a company, you know, sort of stops performing to what you expected on day one, what are you doing to help that business grow? And I think if, if founders ask more questions, it would actually create higher accountability to VCs to actually be able to prove some of the things that they're pitching in their in their initial discussions with founders. Um, and that that side has felt a little lopsided. So that, that would be my suggestion to the team is um, finding somebody who gives you the highest price doesn't mean you have the best partner and you guys should feel empowered to actually go ask questions and look for the data that that proves that the person you're talking to is in fact the right person to help you get through you know the next phase of your growth. So I think I think that's really great. And you know we all know that a good investor becomes an extension of your team and they bring a lot more than just money. So yeah, just like you would interview uh, a new management team member, you should do the same with your investors. So I guess let's talk to somebody who knows a bit about building teams. Maybe Elodie, you know, you guys are very much focused on the growth stage. So what exactly does that mean? What, what you know, because we, we, we get a lot of tips and a lot of input for people in the really early stages. But assuming that the companies, they, they've, they've got through that, that, that first stage, they've, they've proven that product market fit, they've got... Um, you know, they've got the core team, some some recurring revenue, but they really want to go after it then. And this is where the growth stage funding comes in. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that means and then how the, the team needs to raise their game to, to access that? Sure. I think uh, to synthesize it, the biggest challenge of going from what I'd call early stage to growth stage is um, the founder. And I'm fully admitting that I'm going through this phase right now with full in. Um, you know, when you're starting a business as a founder, you tend to be the all-star. Um, you're the MVP of your team. You're the one scoring all the points. You're the one designing the strategy. And uh, it can get very comforting on some level to be involved in everything all the time. And when you're trying to make that transition to growth stage, you have to learn to step back from the field. Um, and you actually have to learn how to pick the players, uh, set them up on the field, and have them playing together where everyone is, is on the same team with the same goal but you're no longer in the game. And taking yourself out of that game is, uh, it's difficult for a lot of folks. And I think it's probably the number one reason why I see businesses that are on a very powerful trajectory sort of fall off that trajectory because it means that you've got to start hiring outside of your circle of trust. It means that you've got to start thinking about planning two or three years down the road because you can't stay in reactive mode and you've got to make that switch from reactive mode to proactive mode. Um, and it means that you have to just have faith that something's going to get done and it may not get done the way that you envisioned it would get done. Um, and I've seen this my, again, myself firsthand, right? There are, there are things where I'll say, Hey, I need something that looks like this. And I've got a very clear picture in my head of what it want it to be. And then it comes back to me and it's nothing like what I pictured. Um, and 90% of the time it's actually better than what I had originally thought of. And, and trusting that you've built enough of a foundation to be able to step out of the game and have the game keep playing without you is really that core, I think, uh, that core hurdle that needs to be made for a company to continue to succeed in the growth stage. Um, in terms of what that means practically, right, we're, we're looking at companies that are um, clearly proven product market fit. They've got usually around 5 million plus of revenue. Um, they're starting, you know, they maybe have a handful of salespeople and they're starting to build out that sales team. They're starting to expand from one marketing channel to multiple marketing channels. Um, but it's really around like you've got this, you know, nucleus of an organization that has gotten here today and you know it can't get anywhere further without expanding, um, but showing the discipline around where do you expand first uh, and who's going to be the leaders. The other big mistake I see is people hiring, kind of, I call it the infantry, um, and they'll go hire you know, 15 sales reps without actually having a CRO. Um, and they'll go hire a bunch of people in marketing without having a CMO. And what ends up happening is you, you build this infantry and then you try to bring in a general to work with an infantry that's already there, that's kind of trained itself. That doesn't really work. You need to go find the leadership first have that leadership have a role in building out the team underneath them. Um, and if you can stay really focused on, and, and this is especially difficult when you're cash constrained, right? But sometimes spending 600K on a, a knockout CRO is actually a lot more cost effective for you as a startup than spending you know, 300K on five sales reps. Um, because that one CRO can probably deliver almost as much as those five sales reps. But not only that, the trajectory that they're going to set you on as a business, right? The five sales reps can get you from here to here. But that CRO might be able to change that arc a little bit higher. Um, and even if it takes slightly longer to see that payback, 
ultimately you're going to get the benefit down the road. And so there's this combination game of you've got to have the self-awareness to step out of the game. You've got to have the, um, the discipline to hire the best and like stick to the best, even if they're, you know, maybe more expensive or slightly out of your network or whatever it is that's, that's making that challenging. And then ultimately you've got to have uh, faith in the long term. And one of the one of the disappointing trends that I've seen over the last few years is I've I've heard a lot of CEOs telling me uh, my job is to fundraise, and that's just not true. A CEO's job is to run a company, um, and occasionally part of that is fundraising. But your job is not to be talking to investors all day and you know trying to get to the next round, get to the next round. Your job is to build a high value organization, and if you do that, the money will come to you. Um, and so there's really kind of this discipline around wanting to be able to achieve outcomes in the short term by building for the long term, uh, all of this happening with you no longer in the driver's seat. Uh, those are the, the challenges I see in, in really scaling a company. So, so again, back to that piece of building, building out your team, you know, building, as you say, letting go of some of the things that maybe you would have done day to day and, and, and trusting that there are other people who can come in and, and maybe do it better, do it better than you, than you would have done yourself. Um, so just coming back then, I guess, to, to fundraising, right? And, and you know, some uh, quite often the first thing that people want to do is they want to go out and meet an, an investor. And I always like that analogy that, you know, finding an investor is like finding a husband or a wife. Um, you know, you don't just walk up to a stranger in a bar and ask them to marry you, right? So that, that doesn't work. So you got to, we know this piece of, you got to try and find the best introduction that you can, somebody that knows somebody, and you got to, you know, play it slow and get to know them. And, and I think, Elodie, as you said, um, you know, in interview the potential investor. So just looking to some of the questions that we have coming in, um, and Elodie, maybe bring this one back to you. So you talked about a, a CEO shouldn't feel that raising funding is their full-time job. And one of the questions in from, from the audience is, if it's not the CEO's job, who should be running the investment strategy in a startup? And maybe just to add to that, does that change depending on the stage of the startup? Well, my whole point earlier was that a, a really high quality startup doesn't need an investment strategy. Um, the investment strategy that they're thinking about is, who's my customer? How do I win their hearts and mind? How do I build an infrastructure that gets in front of as many of those customers as possible? How do I make sure that my sales process um, is one where I have you know, mechanized the ability to take a lead, get it to a demo, get it to a close, hand it off to customer success, upsell that customer. And if you're building an actual business and an actual infrastructure, um, you, you can get to cash flow positivity on your own. And then the, 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 the flow changes, right? So instead of you having to go out and meet a bunch of investors and try to find somebody to give you capital, you're going to have a bunch of people knocking on your door to give you money. Um, and that's obviously a much better position to be in anyway rather than, than the first. So, so my first answer is um, the investment strategy is about investing in your own business and figuring out if I had not a single penny coming from outside, how do I get to tomorrow and how do I get to a year from now? And then on top of that, if you do have an opportunity to raise capital, um, obviously it's usually the founders, uh, it falls on the founder's shoulders to be the face of that process. I know for us internally, um, you know, I'm, I ultimately am the person who meets with a lot of the investors. I still have a strategy around, I want everything in our data room and I'm talking about raising a fund. So it's not apples to apples with, with what entrepreneurs are doing, but everything in our data room tells a story and it tells the same story of the pitch that I'm telling in meetings. And that pitch is like reflected in the different, you know, uh, folks that I've listed as re references where each piece of the story will be highlighted by somebody who had a personal experience on it. But there's, there's always a, a unity to what I'm doing. It's not an ad hoc, like here's a bunch of random information. Um, and so I think that if you're trying to position yourself the best possible, number one, have a great business. Number two, you should know your business by heart. Um, one of the biggest concerns I have is when founders just don't know like things that are so critical. Like they don't know their sales numbers. They don't know what the month ended at. They don't like, they're, they're not showing interest in the pieces of the company that are so foundational that if any of those is weak, the whole thing falls apart. Um, and if you don't have that interest, then you know you may wanna consider bringing in a partner who actually is interested in that piece. So that that's kind of a tangent to what you were talking about. But one of the, one of the areas that we're trying to build a fund differently, um, there's a lot of you know VCs out there who are saying, I want to back a founder that can take this thing all the way. And I actually personally think that that's really unrealistic. Um, most of us are not Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, most of us are not, you know, Benioff. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can't build great businesses, but it does mean that we're going to have to do it as a team as opposed to a solo player. And that means you have to have, again, self-awareness to say, these are my strengths. 
these are my weaknesses and I need to find somebody whose strengths are my weaknesses and vice versa. And if you start to build a team around yourself that can address some of the things that you're just not interested in, like I'm not a details person, I hate details. Um, so I have a team around me that focuses on the details so I can think about the big picture because that's where I'm, I'm most useful, right? Um, but I think a lot of founders have one, um, a misguided view that they need to be able to do it all um, and they may not be that person. And rather than trying to change yourself into something that you read in an article is what so-and-so fund is looking for, be yourself and then just say like, this is how I see the world. This is how I've built my team to make it successful with what we have and what we're working with. And I think that will go a lot further in terms of credibility. I've seen a lot of founders who are just like, honestly full of hot air. Um, they come in, you can see something in the data, something that looks bad, and they try to spin it as somehow it's like a positive thing in the build in the business. Like, I think it's a lot more compelling when founders say, yeah, this was actually a huge mess up. Here's what went wrong. Here's what we found from it. Here's what we learned from it. And here's what we've done to prevent that from happening in the future. And being able to show growth as a leader, um, I think is a lot more impressive than, you know, trying to tell a story of being perfect on day one, which is, again, not likely and not realistic. Um, so I think those are, are some of the, the things that I'm focusing on but now I also sort of forgot your question <laughs> no I think look I think I, I think that's great because you you kind of tied in with what Saul was saying about you know just that cohesion right so I mean if you if you're going to pitch that story you got to be able to back it up you got to tie it all together and that's all Hill said when you're asked for something when you're asked for something at a due diligence to back up something it should be there you should be you should have it at your fingertips and that comes from being in the details of your business and if you can't be you know bring somebody else in with you who, who can who can bridge that gap so i think that's that's really interesting um the thing that we look at that maybe isn't obvious to a lot of people so we were looking at a deal in december of last year it was three going to 9.7 uh, had 260 uh, 260 something percent net dollar retention after a year. Um, so huge upsell across the base. Um, lots of reasons to like the business, accelerating growth, diversified partners, yada, yada. And it was in the food space. And one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, okay, what happens if 2008 comes back? So uh, I've had the good fortune or bad fortune, or however you want to look at it, to invest through the downturn in the US in 2008, 2009. I was investing through the uh, global economic crisis in 2011, 2012 in Europe. And then I invested through the crisis down in Brazil in 2014, 2015. So I've been through my fair share of, of down cycles. Um, and one of the first things I said was we need to look at the actual customer base. And I want to understand what percent of customers are VC backed tech companies. Because if something goes sideways, the first playbook in any VC is cut cost, cut headcount and like preserve cash. And in that situation, you could end up losing a lot of customers because there's going to be a, a decision made at the top from the board level to just pull pull back costs. Um, and when we looked at this particular business, I think it was like 35 or 40 percent of its customer base was VC backed tech companies. So we ultimately passed on the deal because of that. Um, and then COVID hit and they lost like 95 percent of their revenue. Um, and so, you know, I think this is it's one of those things where. I'm probably not the the biggest advocate of Silicon Valley investing just because it's outside of my DNA. But one of the things that I struggle with the most is when you're selling to all your friends who also have tech back, you know, VC back tech startups. Um, it's a it's a dangerous ploy for growth. Growth, and you'd probably want to bring in some pretty stable long term customers that are uh, less susceptible to the market dynamics. Okay, now I'm done. So. Okay, so thanks for that, Elodie. So look, we're going to wrap up in a minute, and I just want to maybe, you know, anytime I get an investor on a call, I always like, there's one question I always like to ask. So, so, so I'll, I'll position this to you first, and then maybe, Elodie, you come in. But we always talk about, you know, pitching the investor, getting them, you know, getting them the information and, and telling them the story. But there's always a couple of things that potentially invest, scares investors off. Um, and, and, and quite often they can be things that are, are, are simple or basic or, or just should be organized but aren't. So I'd love to hear from you guys. Are there any examples of what uh, companies just should not do or, or things that they should have organized all the time that they don't and, and, or maybe just things that they, they should never do? Um, and then if you want to add to that, maybe just one wrap up tip that, that you want to give the audience as well. Don't come into the room and start talking to my male associate and assume he's the partner just because I have long hair, which still happens um, more often than it should. So just be conscious of the fact that women can be investors, too. Um, I would say it's a personal pet peeve of mine. It's very stylistic, but 
I absolutely can't stand when I'm getting excited about somebody's idea and I've jumped like 15 steps ahead in their pitch because I understand it all already because I've seen enough to, to get there. And I start asking questions and they say to me, oh, I have a slide on that. Let me get to it in 10 minutes. It's like, well, I don't care about the other stuff coming in the next 10 minutes because now I'm thinking about this and I've probably already like figured out the things that you're going to tell me. Um, so if investors are asking questions, it's a really great sign and you should lean into that and try to get it into a conversation as fast as possible rather than um, you know, I kind of perceive it as like a little bit insecure if you have to like stick to your script to get through a pitch. Um, also, if you see that the conversation is like super flat, um, it's usually not a good sign and it doesn't mean that they're very engaged or they don't really like your business. And what I've been most impressed with is the founders that have kind of picked up on that cue and said, you know, kind of tried to accelerate the, the meeting and just said like, look, you know, based on where you guys are, maybe we're a little bit early for you. Maybe the right next step is that, you know, we go do these things and we'll come back to you guys in six months and like find a way to to just read the audience a little bit um, rather than just trying to dig in deeper and deeper into the pitch and try to get somebody convinced that's not going to get there. Um, and the same again goes for, for VCs, right? There are times where I'm, I'm talking to a founder and I'm like, this person just hates me. Um, and I'm not going to like put them through the misery of having to listen to me for another hour. Like I just say like, look, you know, we may not be the right fit. And if that's the case, then that's okay. Um, but here's what I like about your company. If this makes sense, this could be a great proposed next step. And just try to make it like, the number one rule in my mind is it's not about you. It's never about me. It's never about you. It's always about the person across the table. And the more you can bring that to a meeting, I think the more effective you can make it. So listen, that's great, great advice. And I think any, anybody that's listening today will have picked up some really, really good uh, tips. So thank you both. Really appreciate your taking the time and, and talking to the Startup Grind audience. Um, so Marion, we hand it back to you. So thanks everyone.